In your careers, one of the key challenges you'll face if you're going to work in any environmental area is the loss of biodiversity as well as the impacts of climate change. And I believe we need to think carefully about building personal resilience for how you cope with that because burnout is really common. So I want to recognise straight off, I love you guys. I just think that you're such an inspiring group, you know, people's backgrounds, where you've come from to be at this point, and then your, your ideas and your hopes and dreams for the future. So this is an image of uh, some of the students from previous years. I, I really love this course for the collective of the group and you know the amazing backgrounds that people come with. So I want to just talk about this topic in two steps and I really want to step over part one really quickly because we've already talked about it in uh, lectures already about climate change but uh, the problem in that we face in dealing with despair and burnout is that uh, yeah we've got this these incredible losses that we experience and it can often seem like we're not achieving and not likely to achieve success. Uh, and I want to really focus on finding your answer and suggest you five strategies uh, to cope with ongoing inaction and losses that are associated with it. And they're strategies that I presented to a, a group at the school last year, research masters, uh, uh, well, research higher degree students, so students doing research masters and PhDs. So even if you're not directly researching climate change and biodiversity loss, depression, anxiety, despair and burnout are really common and yeah, we need to talk about that in terms of our community. So can I tell you a story? You already know a bit about my background, but um, my story is entwined with lots of other stories. So a story about fighting to protect the places you love. Uh, this was a news item uh, about a researcher, um, Jamie Kilpatrick, who's been an uh, amazing researcher in Tasmania, uh, working on heathlands. And yeah, basically his love of the place that he has researched and worked tirelessly to try and protect. So it's really common for people to fight to protect their communities, fight to protect the places they love. So for me, that's the Great Barrier Reef. So me as a kid growing up, that was sort of you know, where I grew up. And, and you know, me as a kid with my brother and uncle spearfishing, you know, just in North Queensland um, and surrounded by cane fields. And when I was a, about 15, I had this idea that there were all these scientists who had all this knowledge and all these lawyers and politicians who made decisions and they didn't seem to be able to communicate very well. So I thought I'll do science and law and be like a translator between the two. Uh, I've since learnt that I actually uh, misdiagnosed and I should have actually gone in. The, the problem isn't uh, about communication, it's um, about hearing and I should have probably studied uh, hearing loss because there's plenty of uh, communication from the science sector and then there's a, effectively a deafness in responding to it. So yeah, my winding path to get here has really led me through a lot of litigation and so I focus on litigation, uh, yeah, so a lot of work on the Dani mines and the like. And I want to skip over that because we've you know, talked about the threats of climate change and the fact that you know we've seen incredible coral bleaching um, already and yet these things are approved and the thing that is hardest to take is that we're drowning in data like the I, I talked about in the lecture on climate change the amount of information in the IPCC reports we are drowning in data and more of it isn't likely to change the current political inaction and apathy. So the IPCC reports is huge amounts of information. Um, and, you know, we're drowning in it. 
and a lot of it's really well presented. So, w with the, you know, in terms of communicating ideas, you know, this is a really nice clear graph uh, showing essentially the catastrophic bleaching in the northern part of the GVR in 2016. Um, and you know, an image like this, which I've just taken from a website. So you've got healthy December 2014. Dying February 2015, dead August 2015. If you look at that from a science communication perspective, that is a brilliant visual. You know, it's both beautiful and horrific. It's easy to understand it. You don't need, you know, it's not a complicated graph or anything like that. So, in terms of communication, you think how much better can we communicate this? You know, you've also got brilliant communicators like David Attenborough giving documentaries, so we're drowning in data and information. This is another great visual, a, a bleached reef before and then covered in algae afterwards. So these you know, visuals, they're all around us uh, in the news. And also we've got a huge amount of data from, we've known about it for a long time. So Ophir Goldberg, who I've mentioned, this, he's this great, the director of the Global Change Institute. This was his seminal paper back in 1999 after the first major or mass coral bleaching event. And he projected that the results suggest that the thermal tolerance of reef building corals is likely to be exceeded every year within the next few decades. Events as severe as 1998, the worst on record, are likely to become commonplace within 20 years. You fast forward 20 years to 2016, 2017, uh, we've had massive coral bleaching events again. So that was, you know, we've known this it's been in the scientific literature for a long time. So alarm bells were ringing, have been really ringing really clearly for a long time. And yet it's basically met with a collective shoulder, shoulder shrug. You know, even in the face of clear catastrophic impacts like of climate change, political inaction persists and there's no emergency action taken to address the cause, only the symptoms. So, you know, our politicians are saying, well, we need to provide the firefighting services now to protect people's homes, but they're unwilling to address the cause. And, and you know, we treat going higher, so we're at one degree now, we treat going higher to a mean global temperature change of two degrees like it's no big deal. It is a huge deal. So, yeah, there's this collective shoulder shrug and this um, quote from Churchill, again, I think is... Uh, amazingly apt. So they, the government, go on in a strange paradox, decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, all-powerful to be impotent. And that was a quote from 1936 talking about the inaction by the UK government in the growing threat from Nazi Germany. So, you know, that quote can easily fit into our current Prime Minister right now. He's solid for fluidity. Um, this was just a quote from him from just a week ago. He says, there's no evident links Australia's carbon emissions to bushfires. And he suggests that Australia could increase emissions without worsening current fire season and says government finalising plans to crack down on environmental protests. So we're going to crack down on people who are protesting about our inaction. And notice also that he, he actually gives a straw, a straw man argument in that he said, he's talking there about Australia could increase its emissions without worsening the current fire season. So he talks about Australia acting in isolation and no one is suggesting that. So he makes this false argument about Australia acting alone, that it wouldn't change our bushfire risks, but no one's arguing for Australia acting alone. What the criticism of the Australian government is about the lack of ambition for Australia's contribution to the collective response to climate change. So yeah, basically our response is put our fingers in our ears and go la 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 la, I can't hear you scientists. So given this, how can we manage, because this isn't likely to change. Um, I don't know if there will be a, like a Pearl Harbor event that will change it, but it, you know, this guy, Scott Morrison just won the last federal election and, you know, so he's there for at least another three years. And they seem to be just stuck in this denial. So how do we go on in the face of that? 
And I'm going to suggest five strategies for doing it. To me, and this is you know, my, own personal, my own personal strategies, which I've tried to, um, I suggest, as, hopeful, as maybe helpful for you. Okay, so the first strategy that I suggest in this is be kind to yourself and remember why you started working in this area, why you, you, know, why you would take a course like this, uh, why you know, you're interested in making a change. So be kind to yourself. And a few years ago, I've actually often think about my friend uh, or a friend, Jared Harris. I, as a kid, I grew up with him um, uh, in the Wood Sundays. You know, often went around to his house after school, after primary school, uh, and yeah, spent a lot of time fishing and doing stuff with him, playing around on mangroves. And he was a really happy kid, and yeah, a really happy part of my childhood. And we sailed together and the like. Anyway, um, back in 2012, he committed suicide, and I just never been able to reconcile how what went wrong with his life. That you know, it went from this happy kid that I knew as a 12-year-old to killing himself as a, well, a 40-year-old. And I've never been able to reconcile that, but I often think when I feel like I'm inadequate or not you know, doing well enough in terms of changing things, I just think, you know, be kind to myself and not think of all of the things, you know, all of the better people or the better lawyers or the better people who are able to argue things that I can't or I'm not able to, or you know, don't have the skills to do, or don't do well enough. You know, then I'm in there trying and doing the best with what I've got. So be kind to yourself. I think is really important. The second uh, thing I'd suggest is see your career as a marathon, not a sprint. And I think that's really important because I think particularly, you know, like particularly for you guys who are undergrads. <laughs> You're thinking, you know, I want to get my first job's got to be a great job and, you know, I want to really do lots of things and you want to make immediate changes and the like. But often think, you know, if you think about your career progression that hopefully you will be working in this area for, say, the next 30 years. So your early jobs can be stepping stones to gaining skills and moving to hopefully more senior management positions as you progress through your career. So it's not all just going to be done in the first two or five years of your career. You've got, think of your career as a 30 year horizon and what is going to sustain you over that career. It's a marathon you're in, not a sprint. So don't um, run at everything like a bullet at China. In, in a, don't just run at things, but you know, pace yourself. And yeah, it's really common to see people in the conservation sector burn out. And, you know, they come in and they work really hard for a while and, you know, you, they're involved in everything and they're doing everything and they're working, you know, 20 hour days and um, they keep doing that for a few years and then they burn out and they go away and they get a job doing something else that actually earns the money, you know, they can no longer live on, you know. A little bit of you know the the trickle of money that you might get for working in the conservation sector and yeah they burn out and drop out and what I'd say is don't let that happen to you so think of your career as a long-term proposition that you're wanting to be doing this for the next say three decades so yeah think of your career as a 30-year marathon not a one to two year sprint so the third strategy that I'd suggest is recharge regularly, and that can be obviously exercise, you know, all of the um, Beyond Blue and the um, strategies about avoiding depression talk about the importance of exercise, being with friends, you know, doing those sorts of things. So spending time with your friends and doing things you love. Another really valuable thing, I think, I, I was involved in a program a few years ago called the Al Gore Climate Leadership Program. And in one of the training sessions they suggested one of the really important things to do is to turn off your phone or you know don't look at emails on the weekend or turn off the news on the weekend. And and I think that that's really valuable if you're going to be working in this sector to you know treat it like a 9 to 5 job and give yourself time off on weekends and holidays to recharge. 
So yeah, for me, I really love walking in remote places. So this is in southwest Tasmania. Um, and yeah, even just going to the beach, walking on the beach, take time off, you know. Going to a pla beautiful place like Springbrook, like we did. So yeah, it's really important to stay in touch with those wonderful places that you love because they will recharge you during your career and remind you of what you're working to protect. The fourth strategy I'd suggest for avoiding burnout and you know, finding success in your career that's you know, really meaningful to you is that accept that it's rational to despair in the face of the crisis that we're facing and move beyond acceptance of that to work for positive change despite the potential for failure. And that idea comes from a wonderful teacher in the US, uh, Joanna Macy, who's written about despair and empowerment, that it's actually perfectly rational to despair in the face of these threats because there doesn't seem to be any rational reason for expecting that it won't get worse and worse. And so it's rational to despair, but then move beyond that and be empowered to go on and fight anyway. So she talks about active hope, which is a practice that sustains, um, yeah, a practice which sustains active hope based on taking a clear view of reality. Uh, so if you haven't, for instance, looked at climate change before, I'm sure you found um, the lectures on the science and the threats we face confronting. I find it really confronting presenting it, talking about it. Uh, as much as I can within my own, you know, paradigms and bi personal biases, I've tried to present it to you as I understand to be the correct um, facts, that this is reality, this is the reality we face. So try and take a clear view of reality. Identify your vision for what you hope is going to happen and then take active steps to help bring that vision about. So active hope. And hope is an essential part of success. Despair and denial have the common outcome of inaction. So if you deny something's a problem, you don't need to take any action. If you despair about it, there's no point in taking any action. So denial and despair are n n not productive. You've got to work somewhere in between. Yeah, and there are reasons for hope, like the energy of young people and I say that young people to all of you guys in this classroom, you're all young to me, an old codger like me. So I look on those protests as just yeah, wonderful because what else is happening that, you know, positive? There's nothing changing the political dynamic other than uh, these protests. So young people and others demanding change and refusing to submit. So be part of it. And also, you know, there's a lot of wonderful people working in this space. So this is a picture taken uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, a, um, a woman on Kiribati talking about um, essentially uh, action that they could take and problem solving. So this was just a training session within a local village. But you know, there's a lot of people working on this that are wonderful. And yeah, there's no plan and B or planet B that we're going to. So the fifth strategy that I'd suggest is choose to use the skills that and tools that you have to save what you can. So choose to fight to protect the people and places you love. And I believe one of the key things that is really important in your careers is to make a spirit of service part of who you are in your future. And a few years ago, I read this book, which was instrumental to my thinking. It was a book by Viktor Frankl. It's famous. He was a German philosopher. Uh, he was a Jew and interned in World War II in Auschwitz and wrote afterwards, he survived and wrote about uh, humanity's search for meaning, that what he had observed in concentration camps was when people lost hope, they quickly died. And it was only the people that had something, some reason to live that kept going. So in the concentration camps, he would try and counsel people like if they 
were, you know, a, if they had been separated, if they were a mother who'd been separated from her children, that her reason to keep going was to try and find her children afterwards, that that gave her a reason, so meaning. And so he wrote about, I'll change the, it was written in 1946, so, and written in German, but Man's Search for Meaning, let's call it Humanity's Search for Meaning. Uh, so that sort of, you know, we looking for meaning and, um, yeah, the, the power of, you know, ideals that striving for um, positive change. This quote from Mandela, every important change in history was impossible until it happened. So, yeah, we need to fight for the future we want and, yeah, don't just accept unacceptable outcomes that we've currently got on the, on the plate and fight. So yeah, fighting doesn't mean, you know, blowing someone up. I mean, um, not acts of aggression, but refusing to passive, passively accept unacceptable outcomes. And in this, I think a spirit of service is really important. So a few months ago, I attended a, it's actually last year, a talk by um, this man, um, Richard Burke. He's an Australian lawyer who works on capital punishment cases in the US and works for a uh, community legal centre that helps people who have been uh, either charged with crimes that they can be put to death for or have been um, sentenced to death and basically working on their appeals. And he talked about how their legal centre, one of the core values was a spirit of service. And, and I think that that is one of the key things that we need to re-engage with, that there's so much in our, you know, our ideals about um, self, like the selfishness of, uh, to me one of the, the saddest things about the Trump administration, and it's sad on many levels, is that no one bats an eyelid now that he's completely self absorbed and that he's so selfish that he's sort of the epitome of selfishness. He does everything pretty well for himself and there's no real element of public service in his role even as president. It seems to be all about him. So he's just completely self-absorbed and selfish and that's his driver. So the idea that you're actually going to work to help others and help other things, that spirit of service, I think is really, really important. So yeah, don't give up in that. So to wrap up, um, despair and burnout is a big issue. And if you don't think it applies to you, okay. But it applies to a lot of people. It is a big deal, particularly in the conservation and environment sector, it's easy to just get worn out and then give up and go off and, you know, decide you're going to be, go and work as an accountant or something rather than working in the environment sector because you feel, you know, you're always being defeated. So finding your answer, I've suggested five strategies. Uh, I put them up there, they'll be on the slides. Maybe you can think about them. Uh, if you've got any others that you think, uh, are useful? Does anyone have any strategies you'd, you would be happy to share? If you've got any thoughts about them, I'd love, or thoughts about this, uh, I, these ideas generally, I'd love to have an email from you. If there's something that you think works better for you or... But I do think it's important to think about how you're going to maintain yourself over your career because yeah you get confronted with a lot of obstacles and it's easy to lose direction lose um, you know the drive that's got you know where you are now and the drive of what you're pursuing what you want to achieve it's easy to be deflected from that and go off into something that's easier or you know earns you money earns you more money um, all of those pressures are things that we all confront. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. Love to hear from you. If you've, if you've got any thoughts, send me an email or talk, give me a call.